So I'm going to thank everybody for inviting me into their community. And I also want to take just a, a, a little moment to um, thank the ancestors of this land and, um, and for permission to speak in their land. Um, I had a lot of ancestors from this region as well on the Penobscot side. So um, I like to always take that opportunity to acknowledge them, especially when I pass through their territory. Um, so I want to thank Susan for uh, introducing me. And um, presently, I'm working at the University of Maine um, in the climate change outreach program for the tribes of Maine and, uh, and also involved in Wabanaki research in climate change. I've done a number of research projects with Dr. Darren Ranko over the past 10 years on climate change in the territories and looking at uh, culturally significant species and how they're impacted uh, and how that's impacting our culture and our, our cultural survival in climate change. Um, so with that, I, um, tonight what I'm going to be talking about mainly is uh, Wabanaki people and how climate change has and the earth changes has impacted their territories. And I will also will be talking a little bit about the epistemology and the cosmology of Wabanaki people and how they view the land and, um, and, and the natural resources within uh, the territories, both ter um, terrestrial and aquatic. So um, I think it's really important there uh, for people to understand how we perceive the environment and, um, and because a lot of our spirituality and our culture is based on how we interact with the environment. And without access to that, we lose our culture and we lose our language and we lose the ability to transmit that knowledge to the younger generations. Um, and so it's important for me for non-natives to understand those implications so that we can come to a better understanding and relationship with each other. And that's my whole um, I guess you would say goal behind teaching at the college level and I've taught at Bates and um, I'll be teaching at Colby uh, but my love is research um, and this is something that I talk to my students about a lot I I'm not into um, having the students feel guilty about what happened to Native people, what I do want is a greater understanding and a better relationship. And so that's what I teach in the, how I approach my topics and in my classes. And I think that that's really important. What's your, um, what's your, uh, how do you do that? Not to, not to um, what do you say? I, I'm curious. <clears throat> What I do is I try to get them in, into the readings to look at um, some of the things like um, superior court cases um, and how they impacted the people um, and how that, you know, it really produced a lot of poverty and hardship within Native community as a result of regulation. And so what I do is I have them look at the, the readings and know what actually happened. I, that, that's important as much as sometimes it's hard to hear or read about. But I also ask them, you know, to uh, look for ways uh, on how to make things better and how things could change for the better. That's mutually beneficial for both people, both Native American people and non-Native people. I don't think that making somebody feel guilty about uh, the past is leading us in the right direction. Whose intent is that? I don't think it's Native people's intent to do that. 
No, but I think that a lot of the younger generation internalizes a lot. And um, non native, both. And, um, you know, and that's my experience that younger people tend to internalize a lot of things that are going on and what is happening. And um, I don't know, all I see when I look at my students are little bright stars. And, and I don't want to dim that light. That's just my philosophy on teaching. So, with, without further ado, we'll, we'll get on with the discussion. And so there's a few key terms that uh, I will be mentioning within the discussion in anthropogenic. It's really human-induced environmental changes like pollution, land changes, and extractionism. Cosmology is the nature of the universe and basically how the indigenous people view creation. Epistemology is the belief systems that we hold, the philosophy and the knowledge systems. TEK, or traditional ecological knowledge for those who haven't heard the term before, really uh, describes um, accumulative indigenous knowledge of local resources, beliefs and practices that is place-based. And it's often preserved in the oral traditions, the songs, stories, and spiritual practices. Um, this is bugging me. Um, I don't, sh there's somebody that wants to get in. Should I just hit admit? Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to get my picture off from there. Um, and so what we have that is occurring with the tribes within the state of Maine in particular, and it occurs across the United States and Canada, is we have multifaceted mechanism impacting socio-ecological resiliency of indigenous people. And particularly, I'm talking about tonight, are the Wapanaki. And, um, and here, whoops, I just, okay. Here, um, I have a little graphic that I just want to explain a little bit. Uh, here is, um, that impinges on cultural survivability and resiliency of uh, the native tribes and their culture. And, as you can see, the outer ring that impacts or impinges on them the most is state regulatory control. Um, and this is for socio-ecological resiliency. And as we get further into the lecture, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, climactic impacts are another um, factor that's impinging on Wabanaki resiliency. And then access. Um, whether that be um, pollution, whether it be um, being um, disassociated with the land in some way, whether it be a loss of species, culturally important species, all of these um, prevent access to um, practicing our culture. And then below we have cultural practices and which centered, all centers around the cultural survivability and the resiliency of Wabanaki people. So we have the uses of natural resources in indigenous community. Um, we have the, the different natural resources as food, the different plant medicines that we use, utilities such as baskets and ash, that we harvest uh, birch bark for our boats. Um, and it teach, we teach values through the use and activities uh, when we practice culture and harvesting these natural resources, ecological stewardship, um, and spirituality. These are all part of our cultural identity and our solvency as a tribe. 
And so when we talk about the Wabanaki cosmology and epistemology, it's really a central way of life that includes a paradigm of co-participation amid the dynamic changes within the ecology, and it involves sharing the land and water with others, both human and non-human. And this is what I have coined in my research as the concept of holism in Native society. Holism really links Webinaki people as co-creators through aspects of their individualism, their kinship ties through clan um, relationships, social cultural ties, and cultural connection to the greater ecology that actually states that all life is sacred and interconnected. And so when we look at the concepts of holism, the ways of knowing through ancient human interactions with the ecology, they're founded on the culturally embedded sacred covenant of holism with what we call Kutulnabemkawug, which means all of our relations, and that includes both humans and non-humans. And you can see this playing out through our clan systems. For instance, my clan is Ver clan, and, um, and so that's a sacred animal to me, and that's my relation. And so, and it's also a medicine symbol for our people. The bear is the medicine, um, that's the carrier of the medicines, and all, most bear clans throughout Indian territory are medicine people. And this is stated the same way in Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, and Maliseet, and it's a little different for the, in the Mi'kmaq language, which is Mitsik Nokamuk. And Nokamuk really is a root word for grandmother. Holism links the Wabanaki as co-participant and co-creator, as I said earlier, and um, aspects of the kinship and social cultural ties, and it, uh, it states that all life is sacred and interconnected. This is handed down through the generations and, and through the language uh, with the values of interrelationship and interdependency, which is really ecological mutualism. And so when we look at determinants of good health within Native society, it really includes the ability of Native people to interconnect with the land, access culturally significant food sources, and access water bases of ancestral origin. Any separation of these aspects of wellness have a ne negative impact on the social ecological systems, the social uh, psychological and spiritual development within native society and the subsistence way of life over time. And we have seen this happen. Um, we look at good health very differently than um, your contemporary health system does today. And so in caring for the terrestrial and aquatic systems that link our cultural survival here in Maine, we look at the traditional food sources that ensure the continuation of a good life and what we call wulilitu in our language. The protection of the ancestral territories for spiritual and ceremonial practices and the ecological protection of many culturally important relatives, Katilna Bemkawuk, from overuse. And so when we talk about natural resources in the language, we talk about Katilna Bemkawug, and it is all of our relations. We're part of that co-creation and co-participant amid the ecology, and we don't see ourselves as different or, or higher or more evolved. What are some of the traditional food sources? Um, some of the traditional food sources are, of course, the, the mammals. Uh, the deer, the moose, is a significant, culturally significant animal for us. Some of the natives eat bear, rabbit. Um, those are the protein sources, eggs, um, birds, uh, different types of birds. Um, fish, lots of fish is part of our diet, both freshwater and saltwater fish. Um, and in terms of the plants, there are tons of berries that we ate. There are 
also uh, a lot of tubers that we we ate um, the the sun the sun uh, there's a there's a root that we ate a lot and it's uh, I think it's called a sun sun choke that's yeah. it and um, and that you will see um, growing along like the shoreline and peninsulas where and if you know anything about the ecology in the springtime when we have the early spring floods it brings a richness into the soil and then it dissipates and it and then the water goes down well these are prime uh, nutrient rich soils in which the native people used to plant these sun chokes there so when they were traveling back and forth they had sources they knew where these sources of food would be growing and convenient for them the berries as I said they ate a lot of those they ate um, some greens um, in the summertime our superfoods and I say this was the wild berries for us um, we invented fruit leather um, and we added it to um, our pemmican sources when we were traveling. And so these were our primary superfoods. And there's a lot of other health benefits with the berries. And the women use these berries primarily for uh, their own health and for different ceremonies, rites of passage ceremonies, and what we call the moon ceremony or the moon lodge. Uh, they would use the strawberry, and there's a whole big story behind the strawberry that represents the heart and forgiveness in our, in our teachings. And as a nutritionist, I researched some of the constituents that were contained in, in the strawberry. Um, and um, you have a really high level of uh, antioxidants, and there's a particular um, constituent called elagic acid that grows um, is very high in the wild strawberry and um, it actually um, kills uh, carcinogenic cells within the reproductive system of a woman particularly in the breast tissue and so what we did with the strawberries was and I say that our people were ahead of their time they would use the women would use these strawberries um, to fast on during that during their moon cycle and it actually cleansed they used it for cleansing and um, and so at the same time they were taking care of their reproductive organs in a preventative way and uh, clearing out toxins from these areas and so I always say that science science is just catching up to us so um, no, it was the berries, was the, berries? the berries and the juice. Okay. Wow. And it's really high in the wild plants. It's moderate in the organic plants, and there's, yeah. it's negligible in the commercial strawberry. Yeah. Yeah. It has a very high ORAC level, uh, and that's the antioxidant content. So we have both it, traditional and non-traditional economies occurring in our communities. We have about 60% of Native people across the United States that depend on mixed subsistence lifestyles. Um, and so that involves our traditional economies. Um, and um, a lot of that is blocked because of access. And we have high rates of poverty. So, um, with my nutrition background, what concerns me is food insecurity as a result of that. And um, so some of the examples of, um, I can't see that top part. Um, some of the examples of the traditional econ economy are uh, knowledge, tra uh, knowledge systems transfer, trade and bartering items, family expenses and financial obligations, elder care and needs, energy needs such as firewood, traditional and non-traditional governance systems and values, and transportation via highways or waterways. A lot of our native people use canoes or boats, particularly in Indian Township, 
when they're harvesting, they go out on those lakes, those series of lakes, uh, and they use the waterways there all the time for harvesting various plants or animals or fish. Um, we have our native guide services and our indigenous arts as part of our traditional economy and ceremony um, and spiritual support for traditional leaders is also really part of our, it's part of our exchange system with the elders. So we have, in, in the traditional and non-traditional economy systems of food acquisition for food security, including the cultural practices of like utilitarian procurement like ash um, or uh, spruce root for binding off um, our birch bark boats or the resins that we use for glue. Of these culturally important species, just to name a few within the ecology, it really remains fundamental to the recovery, transmission, and mobilization of traditional ecological knowledge. And so here I have a slide, and I don't know if you can see all of that, and um, um, I would like to try and, and increase that, but I don't know how to do it on this. But these are um, the traditional food production, processing, and procurement that really fosters our traditional culture. And it all centers around the harvesting of our food and, and processing it for and storing it for um, our own health. And without being able to harvest these things, uh, we lose our culture. And um, so we have the various teachings on the very bottom of the triangle, and this is really the Native American food uh, uh, pyramid, uh, a little bit different than um, the ADA food pyramid. And as you can see on the bottom, there's teachings, and this includes the traditional language. As we're harvesting, we're teaching. Our culture is a living culture. And so as we go through different phases of life, we're actually providing these different teachings about the different phases of life. We also have plan identification that we teach in the language, um, storytelling, indigenous trade, um, seasonal harvesting, um, and these are the various teachings that, that are centered around um, the harvest, the actual process of harvesting. And then we have the tool makings when we're utilizing various items and resources out there for tool making, we're actually utilitarian. That's all part of our culture. Um, rope making, cord making, um, wood identification, stone napping, tying off nets, um, pole harvesting, um, uh, canoe production, which I, I love to do, um, harvesting, the actual act of harvesting. We're teaching uh, along as we harvest, um, spear fishing, um, spear hunting, tracking, which I also love to do, tea harvesting, um, and all of these different things are part of our living culture. And the women did a lot of the preserving and processing of the food. And so my, one of my primary interests are women's knowledge systems, because the women really were um, the carriers of a lot of the traditional ecological knowledge. And since we're not doing all of these things, a lot of that knowledge has been lost. Cooking, um, solar cooking, um, ash bread, um, also processing like hull corn and stuff. There's a certain way that we did that. Um, baking and cooking into the ground with the fire pits. Uh, and then the actual eating was very important to our culture. And if we're not doing any of that, then we lose our culture. 
Here is a traditional food systems that I developed a, a table here that um, compared the traditional economic values versus the colonial economic values in food systems. And so um, it actually provided the knowledge transfer through the language, as I said before, and that the, sh the sharing of TEK of culturally significant foods um, throughout this process is inextricably linked to the environment and our ancestral territories, particularly as it relates to place-based um, uh, history of our culture. So we have the food systems of acquisition. And the, under the native value system, it was actually through the acquisition, there was a lot of sharing cooperation that went along with that. Under the colonial system today, we have capitalism and competition. Procurement, under the native value, we had reciprocity. Um, and the way that we harvested those items, we always made sure that we didn't take the, the strongest and the biggest plant. We always made sure that that stayed within the environment um, to make the uh, next generation of plants really healthy. And we did the same with animals. Um, the colonial values, it's based on extractionism without any regard for reciprocity. Stability, we have collectivity and transfer of TEK to the youth through our um, native values. And under the colonial values, it's individualism. Security, under the native values, it's community-based. Under the colonial value system, it's commercially based. Planning, long-term sustainability and reciprocity, we look at it through the seven generation lens, both for humans and non-humans. Under the colonial system, it's short-term profits and reward system. Decision-making, it's locally and collectively controlled in the native community. And under the va colonial value system, it's globally controlled through multinational corporations. Distribution accessible to community members under the native community. And in the colonial value system, it's the ability to pay. Consumer system is relationship. Under the colonial system, it's dependency. TEK, SEK management approach. It's responsibility, relationship, reciprocity, and holism. Under the colonial system, it's exploit, dominate, and silo. Nutritional benefits, the quality food sources of culturally significant foods are very high. Under the colonial system, it's suboptimal commercial food sources. And so here you can see uh, the various differences in our value system when it comes uh, to food. The native language, again, in, in the, the use of the language, we have the ability to transmit the knowledge and wisdom that's carried within our elders and the traditional harvesters about the environment, which enables that holistic relationship by the people with what we call Nigwiskiktimig, Mother Earth. Cultural customs and values of respect, responsibility, and reciprocity, including perspectives of the traditional economy, actually safeguard the sacredness of these earth relationships through the living culture, ensuring its preservation for future generations. And again, both human and non-human, and through what we call the seven grandfather teachings, which is a traditional teachings that we follow. Uh, the rites of passage ceremonies, the water ceremonies that you see happening across the state, our clan systems and storytelling. And so we have the anthropogenic and climactic changes in Maine and, and the cultural impacts. And so back in, in 2016, both Darren and I coordinated a project with the Northeast Center of Climate Change at, on campus with the Wabanaki Center. And the intent of, of these climate change sessions with the tribes was to provide a general overview of the climate change vulnerabilities and, and to assist the main tribes to develop a framework for response in climate change with the development of an adaptation and mitigation plan for long-term impacts 
of upcoming earth changes that impact our cultural well-being. And so we had both um, the combination of science and um, traditional harvesters coming together and discussing um, what was going on within the environment. There, there were lengthy discussions on the urgency to transmit this ancient knowledge to the younger generation and the importance of interrelationship with the Katolnabemkawug and the significance of carrying that knowledge forward to share with the future generations. And within the tribal work sessions, what came out with some of the elders that were there and their concern, particularly with climate changes, is that really they did not have any control over climate change. And that was the biggest thing that came out. They didn't feel like they had any control over that. Um, but they also were concerned with the decrease in knowledge transfer as a result of not having access or um, the extirpation of culturally important species or species migration north. And this is happening. And so they, they were concerned that they're, because of all of these changes, that they were having a decrease, overall decrease in knowledge transmission to the younger generation. And there were a decrease in skills to adapt as a result because our language contains a lot of information on adaptation and how we view the environment. Cultural expression, the livelihood of the traditional harvesters was impacted and the traditional kinship ties and relationship to Katilna Bemkawug. And um, let's go on a little bit more here. And so we came out with some of the major indicators for climate change that really went hand in hand with the main center of climate change on campus and what they were picking up. And so here are some of the indicators that the tribes across Maine had mentioned as um, as the changes that they and the concerns that that they were burdened with as a result of of climate changes and one of the biggest ones with economic security the other one the overall theme was was not only economic security both traditional and non-traditional but also the loss of cultural identity and survivability as a result um, we had food security uh, cultural practices was another concern, increased temperatures, extreme precipitation. And if you go down the list, it's pretty much the same across the state. Um, particular things that they pointed out was access to cultural species, tick infestation. Um, you know, a lot of the traditional harvesters depend on moose harvest. And the tick infestation is really impacting the moose throughout the state of Maine and, um, and the reproductive capacity of females. And so this was a big concern for them. And, and then the changes in uh, the seasons with the increased temperature in the fall, the moose aren't moving, they're laying down, and they can't get the meat out of the... Uh, the woods fast enough before the flies get it. And so these are all concerns for uh, tribal harvesters. What were they, um, some of the traditional practices to mitigate um, those They don't have any. Who don't have any? Are you talking about tribal people? Yes. They, ha they don't have any. They don't have any traditional practices Today because we didn't really have the tick population that we do now. You know, I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, we could go and lay in the bushes and the grass and not have one tick on us. Today, you can't do that. Yeah. I was told that um, it was uh, firefighters. Well, yeah, the, um, it, mitigated a lot of that. it did mitigate a lot of that. A uh, lot of the insect population, and, um, and it also cleared out... Um, plots of land for to to uh, facilitate the growth of deer browse and a healthy deer browse and so they would burn for those reasons um, whenever anyone asks a question here 
it would be great to read. Oh, for okay. The Zoom people. I forgot. Just for the Zoom people. Yes. Yeah. And and so the question was what the native people did for tick infestation. It wasn't only for tick infestation, is my point. It was for other things. Um, and so we have an increase in temp winter temperatures here. And I have to just mention on the winter temperature thing, um, an in overall increase in winter temperature, but we also have these drastic freeze uh, episodes that occur with the increased winter temperature. So we have what we call freeze-thaw conditions. And uh, that impacts uh, lumber harvesting, um, so loggers can't get in to harvest. And this is one of our primary economic indicators for the tribes is the forestry operations. Um, so that's impacting that, but also our wild berries, particularly the cranberries with the increase uh, in winter temperatures, you have the ice formation from the deep dives. Um, and so it's actually ki killing, you know, the, um, and decreasing some of the, uh, it's killing some of the plants and it's decreasing the berry yield on, on our wild cranberry sources. And, um, and so they're losing their cranberry bogs as a result too of um, the temperature changes, but also from pollution runoff with increased phosphorus and nitrogen in the atmosphere and in the water sources it's actually causing a lot of weed production within these biosystems that are dependent on nitrogen poor sources, poor environment in order to survive. And the cranberry plants have no way of, of um, they have no way of sequestering nitrogen other than with the symbiotic relationship with some of the, the hyphae from the peat bog. And so what these, these um, what these weeds are doing is they're actually competing and putting more nitrogen in there and it's actually disrupting the whole uh, ecology. Are there plants that sequestrate nitrogen that can be used to make eggs? Um, well, it really, the, the peat bogs uh, depend, um, if you put other plants in there, then there's going to be more nitrogen in there in any way. Um, but with most of the nitrogen, and this is my theory, you know, other botanists have said, well, it's just succession. But I feel that it's being sped up. And it's being sped up through the high concentration of nitrogen in the atmosphere. And it's my, my own theory that, that this is what's causing the excess weed production in some of these uh, bog systems. And in the boreal areas, and this is dangerous because some of these um, boreal uh, peat bogs are one of our primary carbon sinks in, in this region. And we have a high concentration in the northeast for sulfites and nitrogen in the atmosphere from industry coming up from the south and the midwestern states. And the Atlantic Ocean is one of the ocean, the fastest or the incre uh, fastest increases in temperature of any ocean on the planet. And so my theory behind that, and they said, well, we don't know why it's, it's doing that. Well, my theory is because of the nitrogen and the sulfites. They create uh, more greenhouse gases than carbon does. And uh, it causes a lot more acidification, too. So um, I don't know. That's my theory as, as a scientist when I look at climate change. Have you looked into um, sugar kelp? Of what? Sugar kelp for sequestering the uh, CO2. I, I don't. Sugar I, kelp. Sugar kelp. Yeah. Um, no, but that, that has been mentioned. Uh, uh, the question was, has, have we looked into sugar kelp uh, for sequestration, uh, sequestration, what was it, nitrogen? CO2. Oh, CO2. Um, but it is known that, that the seaweeds do assist in that. Yeah. But one of the biggest nitrogen fixers in the ocean are the whales. Yeah. 
and we're losing them too. Um, and then extirpation of cultural species, particularly around the fish, fisheries at Passamaquoddy Bay. I know my dad and listening to some of, he was one of the greatest storytellers ever that ever lived. And uh, he would go on with these stories uh, over time on how the environment has changed. And when he was a young man, he said, you just have to go down to the shore and cast a net and you'd have hundreds and hundreds of fish in your net. And that's all you had to do was one toss. Now they're lucky to, to even get one or two doing that at Passamaquoddy Bay. And as a matter of fact, it's not even practiced there anymore. Um, there's flounder used to, um, there was another man that I talked to down there and he said 50 years ago we'd get pails and pails of flounder and there's not one there today. And so they've lost a lot of their uh, spe native species out of Passamaquoddy Bay as a result of over harvest or a disruption in the habitat. Um, and so all of this has an impact on the language. And um, language, it's already been determined that where there's a richness in indigenous language, you will find a richness in biodiversity. And so with the loss of our indigenous languages, we're having a loss of biodiversity as well. So the loss of culturally important species um, are a major concern for our traditional practices and activities and belief systems within the indigenous societies. Um, the tribes may look to harvest in federally controlled areas to compensate for the lack of resources due to human-induced climate change in some of the ancestral areas and particularly around the ocean areas. So I mentioned the wild berries earlier, and I had actually done a study at Indian Township on the, the wild cranberries. And some of the um, major themes that came out from the participants there that I talked to, and it was mostly the women, because mostly it was the women who harvest wild berries. And so here we have women's knowledge coming through here. And um, the three primary themes that came out of that is the limitation of access, the decline in traditional harvesting practices, and tribal management. Um, so under the limitation of access, a lot of people didn't have a car or a boat to get out to these remote areas where the berries were growing because they used to grow right around, you know, where they lived on the point, but they have to go out further and further in order to harvest today. Um, and they also had a loss of the traditional harvesting sites that I talked about because of climate change, um, the loss of wild berry habitat. Uh, under uh, traditional harvesting practices, we had um, the decline of sustenance practices and traditional life ways the loss of knowledge transfer through the language and the elders are, that we're losing, and then the alternate uh, food acquisition. Some people just go to the grocery store because it's easier. Traditional values are um, declining. Tribal management, there was an overall decrease in traditional harvesters and trappers and the lack of control burns. That was one of uh, the other uses of fire was for our berry, for our wild berry management. Uh, poor tribal management in the berry habitats. Um, and, you know, as far as, you know, the blackberries and um, burning for the blackberries as well as the blueberries and resiliency planning for these wild berries. And I, to me, it's, um, as a nutritionist, it's, it's really important that I feel that the tribes return to taking care of the wild berries because um, a lot of these wild berries, particularly um, the blueberry and um, other berries that are rich in, uh, have a high ORAC level, they also uh, control blood sugar and 
the metabolic syndrome. They actually eliminate metabolic syndrome, which indigenous populations are plagued with today. And I think as a result of getting away from um, managing and harvesting our wild berries, we have that overall metabolic fate that we're going through today. And that's another one of my theories. So and what do we do in order to live a good life? Well, we have a revitalization of our ancestral teachings. And so some of the factors for cultural survival within our community is really access to our culturally significant species, our language use, our knowledge carriers, and our stewardship for biodiversity all contribute to the transfer of indigenous knowledge. And so we have um, the revitalization in our communities of the teachings of what I call the seven grandfather teachings that were shared by the Anishinaabe and the Wabanaki people uh, long ago in our creation stories that were actually used to lead our people back to living a good life or wulilitu. The seven teachings are humility, bravery, honesty, wisdom, truth, respect, and love. And each were depicted by the sacred relationships of significant animals that make up our traditional clan systems and our sacred connection to Katilna Bemkawuk. And so what I did was I developed a, a model um, for use in adaptation for climate change using the seven grandfather teachings. And, um, and as um, uh, a public administrator in environmental management, I used some of the colonial um, uh, stages of management and incorporated the seven grandfather teachings into each of these. And so we have a community-based approach, which um, in our value systems of humility, or NELSU, is knowing your relationship with all life and balance, inclusiveness, and collectivity. Under the TEK and SEK uh, complementary approaches, uh, we have Kachi Tuduwin, Kachi Tuduwin, wisdom, observes all life, prudence, and intelligence, and judgments, and experiences. And under co-partnership agreements and MO, uh, MOUs, we have honesty. Uh, understanding words and actions. Under vulnerability assessments um, for looking at um, tribal risk, we have bravery, which involves making good choices and decisions and learning. And then we have um, complement scientific inquiry. We have Willamie Wagon, which is truth. And these are the earth teachings and the journey and the destination. Kachita Mita Humtum, which is respect. And this is uh, incorporated within the strategies for planning. And this is all part of the aspects of holism. Uh, the need of others, mindfulness, sharing with all animals, trees, leaves, water, grass, spirit beings, water beings, and rocks. And the last one is Kaseltum, which is love and teaches vision, peace, and balance of all life within the management goals and objectives. And this all centers around Wulilitu and true sustainability. And so when we're integrating community-based approaches within the community, we use in our decision-making processes within the, within the indigenous community um, uh, what we call consensus building or what we call two -eyed, also two-eyed seeing. And so what consensus building, the traditional decision-making processes, was really was to ensure the credibility in the mutual beneficial outcomes of the environment and stewardship practices that ensure sustainability. And this traditional approach to decision making must be for the best interest of all the people, not just a few. And it didn't necessarily mean that everybody had to agree, 
but we had to understand that the decisions being made considered the conditions for the future seven generations, both human and non-human. It wasn't just for profit making, in other words. And so what seeing, two-eyed seeing was, and it was developed by Marshall and Marshall in 2012, and these are two Mi'kmaq elders. And what it, what it is, is really, is that you see with one eye, with the best strengths um, of indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing, and you learn to see with the other eye, with the best strengths of mainstream Western knowledges and ways of knowing, such as SEK, scientific ecological knowledge, but most importantly, you learn to see with both eyes together, and this is what two-eyed seeing is. And so what are the outcomes for Wabanaki cultural survival? Well, as a result of all of the um, studies that I've done within the communities in Maine, really the complexity of the multifaceted aspects of climate change combined with the inability to self-determine traditional food systems of treaty tribes actually hinders our ability to build mechanisms of socio-ecological resiliency and environmental challenges. We need planning models that are culturally consistent that will guide the co-management and stewardship of equitable distribution of our natural resources within the terrestrial and aquatic systems, particularly around the ocean fisheries that we have not had. And then the community-based models utilizing an indigenous perspective that will provide an avenue to incorporate traditional value systems into environmental stewardship <coughs> that steers towards policy of inclusiveness on the state level, sustainably, and culturally responsive to the Wabanaki people. And so that's it from my talk today. Do I have any questions from anybody? Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. How much of these values are being taught in the reservation school system? They are being taught very frequently now. They're incorporating a lot of our ancestral teachings within the school systems today. They're not forced to comply with the general curriculum of Right, the main state. Um, they go over and above on the reservations for that. You know, um, uh, when I used to work for the Boys and Girls Club uh, back in 2006, and I did what we called the Medicine Path Project. And uh, they were building houses in a sacred area within the community, and nobody knew that this was once a sacred area for ceremony. And there were a lot of medicinal plants in there. And so I proposed to build um, a, a wooden walkway through there so people wouldn't trample through where all of these medicinal plants were and it could be used for an outdoor classroom. So I just want to remind you to uh, repeat the question, but also if you could stand in front of Oh, um, it's people. off now anyway. Oh, yeah. And. Um, and so it's still being used today, and uh, a lot of uh, teachers that go outside to teach the language and, and stuff say it's one of the best things that's ever happened to the community. And it's right in back of where the elders live so that they can take a walk out there on the uh, boardwalk too. So um, these are sort of like the, the activities that are happening here and there throughout Native community in order to revitalize some of our ancestral teachings. Yeah, it's um, really interesting in the seven grandfather principles, and I was wondering if there were, uh, if you could suggest resources to learn more about the principles in general, as well as the work that you did to tap into the climate, uh, climate change. Um, you can go online. It you it, just type in seven grandfather teachings, Anishinaabe, okay. and it will come up. And the Anishinaabe people actually were from here. And um, they actually lived, uh, they're part of us. And they, and the story that I heard with that was, um, and why they moved west is because some of the medicine people had a vision that there were, um, 
light-skinned men that will, will come and that they will destroy their way of life. The Anishinaabe, and uh, where we consider ourselves the same people, and um, and so and that they needed to take our sacred medicine bundles and teachings with them that were on birch bark, the ancient teachings, and they needed to take them and hide them and protect them, in which they have done. Um, and so. Um, the original story, too, of that was that we had messengers come here or come to them, the medicine people. There were messengers. There were seven of them, and that's where the seven teachings come from. And there were seven messengers that came and gave them a message and a teaching. Part of that was the seven grandfather teachings, but also there was a teaching that um, they needed to take these bundles and protect them. And... Um, and so, um, yeah, if you go online, you'll find some more about it. But they go in a lot more detail in a traditional setting with some of the people. And um, all of these different teachings are actually associated with different animals. And part of those animals are part of our um, clan systems and they each carry a certain teaching with them, and those are the teachings that I just talked about. Are you able to use traditional burning practices on your land in the WJ? Are we able to use traditional what? Burning practices. Burning practices on our lands today. I think it's limited and it's on an individual basis. I don't think that the tribes are doing that collectively in, within the community, and the reason for that is because of the air pollution, the air quality mm -hmm. issues that come up. Mm -hmm. um, and so they haven't gone ahead and done any of that on their lands because of that. Mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's a big conflict with that. Mm -hmm. um, they were talking about doing it on the islands within the Penobscot River. Um, just to get the control burn and to, to control the invasive species that are occurring in our, on our territories. But I really feel it should be brought back. You know, climatically, I, I have to say this because I found it really interesting. Um, and when I was studying forest ecology at the university, um, we talked about some of the history uh, of the forest and the forest ecology along the east coast of the United States. And all of these old pieces of art that paintings, you could see um, some of the paintings had um, where it showed depictions on where the land was burnt from the native people. But there was also a correlation that they did uh, on climate change or climactic changes on the eastern seacoast that correlated with the Arctic blast in Europe because of the carbon mm -hmm. that it produced in the atmosphere. So they had sub-zero freezing weathers in Europe and it was caused from the native people burning here a long time ago. I thought that was fascinating. So did I see another hand here? Do you know if the Native American business ethics are taught in business programs? No, but that was something that was something that I wanted to develop when I was doing my master's in public administration. I was trying to do. And it was actually shot down by one of the professors. They didn't want to read any of that. They wanted me to stay with the classic teachings. So. It was in one fork. I was in business school and they talked about the why it's also interested in seven generations of students not just about that for a very brief period in one class. Well, I have a question about invasive species that you talked about. I was wondering what those were. The invasive species? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, oh, there's lots of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have uh, the Japanese um, 
knotweed. Uh, we have, the, a lot of them are Japanese, a lot of them are Asian plants. Um, then we have the, I think it was a barberry is one of them too. Um, and, and anywhere you see that growing, you have a very high tick population as well. It's correlated with that plant. And so they always say, get rid of it. <laughs> you got it in your yard, get rid of it. Um, uh, there, I think Japanese honeysuckle is another one. Um, and then you have uh, purple loosestrife is yeah. another one. Um, and I don't know how that impacts our native plant, medicinal plants. I think it does. It outcompetes some of our medicinal plants that, important plants that are really important, I feel is really important. Um, it outcompetes some of them in, in some of our boggy systems. Uh, but purple loosestrife is also a medicinal plant. It's for infantile dysentery. And so I think it's important, you know, I, sometimes I kind of question, are they really, you know, some of these uh, plants really invading or is it something that we're going to need in the future? You know, because native people were quick to utilize European plants if they had properties that would benefit them, such as burdock. Burdock is another one. Um, and then colt's foot is another one. Um, you know, and they were quick to use them if they had properties that benefited. So, do we have any more questions? Yeah. Have you considered uh, ways that uh, you might impart some of the native wisdom and beliefs to the non-native population um, because I think that uh, a lot of that uh, a lot of that native traditional wisdom is important it is I agree you get to the non-native and I think that what I did tonight I do teach that in my class mm -hmm. with the uh, college students and, um, you know, the difference in native values versus colonial value systems and how it's all been geared for individualism and profit, uh, where the native is a collective and it's sharing, the value is sharing. And, um, you know, so you don't have a concentration in wealth. You know, it's really frowned upon in native society. Um, in regards to that, uh, like the question of imparting native wisdom on non-native people, um, what do you, how do you think that uh, uh, non-native people can um, can do that in a respectful way? Because I think that there is like a uh, kind of like a history of, of taking things. And then that, that's, a, that's a big issue. It is, yeah. Um, you know, there's, um, there are guidelines for intellectual property rights of indigenous knowledge. Um, and there's a big manual uh, with that. And it's, it's difficult to, I think the most respectful way is what I taught tonight. Um, because you're not really getting into the ceremonies, but you're only getting the concepts of how we perceive uh, a collective society. And also, um, uh, you're not giving out the ceremonies, basically, and some of the TEK knowledge, but just looking at how we perceive it. And if you choose to walk that way and hold on to those beliefs, that's you know, your individual choice. What about when, when uh, colonizers begin to profit off of that knowledge? Well, that is another big issue. And um, 
I think what what the tribes need to do, and that's something that I'm actually working on because I'm a developing a book on um, our own traditional book for adaptation practices for um, natural resource management. And, um, and in that, I'm putting intellectual property right information in there for the tribes to go by. And there are certain steps that the tribes have to take in order to protect that knowledge and to prevent what's occurring on what you just mentioned on profiting off from uh, some of the TEK. And this is why Native people are reluctant to share that knowledge. And so we have to set up these guidelines to protect that. And one way to protect that is that you don't digitize the knowledge. And, um, and that all of the knowledge that you do uh, convey during any of these management activities, strategies for adaptation, that all of that knowledge is transferred to the Historic Preservation Office where it is protected. It is legally protected once it enters that office. But the tribes need to develop that. And so what I'm trying to do in this booklet is give the tribes the tools to do that. And it's really a touchy subject. So uh, New Maine has a strong forestry program and also a sustainable agricultural program. Mm -hmm. um, is there any interaction between, you know, are, are you seeing any of those students in your classes or? Uh, the forestry, any? I don't teach at UMaine. I do research at UMaine. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and climate change outreach at UMaine. Um, but I do have a lot of environmental uh, students in my other classes where I do teach. And, um, you know, we talk about environmental policy and regulation as well in Supreme Court cases and how they're impacting some of those decisions surrounding access for Native people. And um, we do talk about that too as well. Um, Pardon me? <laughs> They're losing it fairly quickly. Um, but um, in answer a little bit more to your question is that they are developing a program for, um, with a cooperative extension program in combining for, for agriculture, native agriculture. And they're just, they'll be starting that program up uh, next month, I think. Um, now, as far as the forestry, um, I'm sure that there'll be some coordination there between those two programs. Um, but as far as forestry, Darren Ranko and John Daigle, two professors at Orono, have developed an emerald ash borer uh, toolkit, I guess you could call it, for the tribes to uh, manage their own uh, emerald ash interventions, coordinated with the state forestry program. So I think of all of the agencies within the state, the forestry, uh, State Forestry Department is the one who has been working really closely with the tribes on that. And we need more of the other agencies to do the same. We have yet to see that. Uh, the slide that you presented this evening available for the public at all? Uh, the slide? The slide that you presented. Um, some of it is in my dissertation. As a matter of fact, most of it is in my dissertation. So if you go online and look for my dissertation, you'll find it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Was your father Ted Mitchell? Ted? Yes, my dad was Ted. What is your name? Miko. Miko. I am. Um, yeah, uh, Ted was awesome. Sorry. Um, I know who you are now. I didn't recognize you with your short hair. <coughs> right. You used to have really long hair. Yeah, my Sorry. <laughs> That's why you were asking me all yeah. of these questions. I was in that movie last week, and they paid me a hundred bucks to cut it off. Really? Yeah, to try to try to have that um, that 
that uh, look. Mm -hmm. the, um, right. The oh, I didn't know that you were in that movie. Yeah, so that's, the, that's the reason why I was back. Oh, well, hello, Miko. I haven't seen you for such a long time. Yeah. Yep. I was 17 then. Yeah. Do we have any more questions for me? I want to thank you for staying with it. I know some of it was very academic and probably dry, but and I know I need to get more pictures.